Hi, I'm Vitaly Klitschko, mayor of Kyiv. You are listening to Ukraine's Latest. I'm Sophie Ko, and this is Ukraine, the latest. It's Wednesday, the 27th of July, day 154, and today is another very special episode. Our usual host, David Knowles, and our defence and security editor, Dom Nichols, are currently out in Ukraine. Over the next week, we'll be hearing from them as they meet prominent Ukrainian politicians, visit some significant locations from the war so far, and speak to those who are experiencing the struggle firsthand to hear their stories. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. This morning, Dom Nichols travelled to the range for the Territorial Defence Unit of Borispol City to see how recruits are taught to survive on the front lines. I've come to Borispil, a city of about 60,000 people, 15 kilometres or so to the east of Kyiv. I'm visiting one of the squadrons of the volunteer formation of the territorial community. This is a group of civilians, basically, who are taken up on reserve contracts. They are drivers, they are doctors. The deputy commander, Vadim, is actually a former diplomat. And uh, these men and women of about number about 150 from a battalion of about 1400 they defend the city and the local villages they're not paid for by the government they buy their own equipment and clothing they have to set up their own range area they get their weapon and ammunition supplied by the government but that's it and they are here they do shifts to defend the city and to uh, check for any uh, Russian agents that still might be operating and they have uh, a quite a large area of responsibility and um, I went to visit with Vadim, the deputy commander, some weapon handling going on, live weapon handling happening in the training area just outside the city. My name is Vadim Triuhan. I'm deputy commander of uh, the company of our volunteer battalion called Boris. And we're at a training area just outside the city, about 15 k to the east of Kiev. What's happening here, Vadim? Uh, now we are on the training center where our people and people from different armed forces uh, units, from police and other law enforcement agencies are training their skills on shooting, on uh, tactics uh, activities and so on. And how many people do you have through here at any one time? Every day we have here approximately 150 up to 300 people. And you're a volunteer battalion, you pay for your own... Uh, equipment and clothing, but not your weapons and ammunition. But you are also trained in the N-Law, I understand. Yes, uh, everything what we have got, almost everything, we buy on our own. Only local entrepreneurs, uh, volunteers, uh, and some more or less uh, rich people uh, assist us. State provides us with the weapons, and some weapons we get from the army, including uh, foreign um, kind of uh, equipment like n I asked Vadim about the international support he was receiving in terms of training and weapon supplies, and he quite quickly launched into how favourable he viewed Britain's Prime Minister Boris Johnson. It's like something fantastic for us, like especially Boris Johnson. And many Ukrainians are now uh, hesitating. What will happen when Boris Johnson will leave his position and who will be the next? You understand more or less than most probably current foreign minister Ms. Listras will take the responsibility for the leadership. But anyway, Boris Johnson will stay in our memory for ages. So, Vadim, what is the role of a territorial volunteer battalion? From the very beginning, the role was quite critical because uh, the army was not able to cover all the directions uh, where uh, Russians appeared. And from the very beginning, in some uh, cities like uh, Bucha, Irpin, Gostomel, volunteer battalions were uh, having fight as um, uh, regular armed forces. Now it's more like law enforcement um, uh, uh, obligations to keep under control the situation in the city, to assist law enforcement agencies like police, security service and so on. But any time we can get an order from the higher commanders to go any part of the battlefield and um, uh, normally people are ready for this. And your people are regular civilians, business people, doctors, drivers... What is your background? 
I'm diplomat and majority people, they are having uh, some job. They have another obligations, but every week they are attending trainings and every week they are obliged to appear on the service uh, for one day or for two days. And in the case of uh, another invasion of Russians to our area, all of them are ready to gather um, together and to spend 24 hours for um, a week every day to fight for our motherlands. And do you have to compel these people to join or do they want to join up? All of them are volunteers. Nobody can force them. They do not have any obligations. Anytime they can terminate their contracts. But majority of them, I would say 99%, uh, they want to stay together. And uh, the only problem is that uh, many people who are experienced, they are willing to go to fight on the battlefield. They are willing to join armed forces. The only problem is that uh, it's not easy task now to join armed forces because um, uh, they normally are well equipped and they uh, do not have many vacuums for the soldiers. And does everybody think that Ukraine will win this war? Uh, 99% of people, of course, um, are sure that Ukraine will win this war. The only issue is interpretation. What is the victory for uh, Ukrainians? Some people say that the victory is uh, to return to the status quo back to 23rd of February 2022. And other people say that um, the victory is uh, when we will return all our territories, including Donbass area and Crimea. But some people say that victory will be when Russia will announce about its capitulation when it actually give up. And even uh, some people um, consider that uh, the victory will be when the Moscow will be destroyed. Majority people want only one thing, to return all our territories. And Vadim, how much training do the people get here, the volunteer groups get here? How long does it take to get them up to basic proficiency with small arms? Uh, I think that there is no any limitation because as uh, many trainings do you get, as more trained you are. You know it as a former um, military guy. But normally every member of the volunteer formation has to go through training every week. Before we had three trainings per week and one training takes approximately six hours plus minus. And is there a, a basic level they have to pass to be able to go on to other training? Of course, from the very beginning, they have got um, so-called um, basic training when they train themselves without any bu bullets. And then uh, every training, they are provided with more and more complicated exercises. Uh, every day, they have to pass through certain tests. If they are not passing the test, then they are punished um, through physical... Um, um, uh, encouragement. <laughs> encouragement, yeah. And normally, people are uh, happy with this because uh, anyway, they understand that uh, as more trained they are, as more useful they are for the uh, battalion as such. And uh, the instructors, your instructors, where do they come from? Are they all ex-regular Ukrainian soldiers? Majority of them passed through the beginning of the war in 2014. They were volunteers um, on the battlefield. And uh, all of them passed through many, many different uh, trainings and they are quite professional because uh, normally they even are able to train people from the security service, from uh, special operations services and so on. And Vadim, is it just volunteer troops you train here or do civilians train here as well? Uh, many civilians are asking us to be trained but now of course it's not possible because the priority is those people who are in the army, who are in the law enforcement agencies, who are in the volunteers battalions. But when the war will be over, will over and when we will get a victory, then of course the special courses for civilians will be permanently in use because Ukrainians have to be prepared to, to meet challenges from the so-called Russian world. We will never believe to Russians. This afternoon, Francis Durney, Assistant Comment Editor at The Telegraph, and I sat down to discuss the latest news and updates from the war. Here's everything you need to know from the past 24 hours. Thank you, Sophie. I spoke yesterday about the apparent beginnings of the Ukrainian counterattack in the Kurzon region. And since then, authorities in the Russian-controlled city of Kurzon have closed the city's only bridge across the Dnieper River after it came under fire from US-supplied HIMARS. The Antonovsky Bridge, according to the deputy head of the Russian-appointed city administration, has been closed for civilians, but its structural integrity has not suffered from the shelling. Reading into this, supposedly the Ukrainians don't actually want to destroy the bridge, which could impede their advance in due course, but make it impossible for the Russians to use it safely for resupply in the coming counterattack. 
In other news, the Ukrainian parliament has approved the appointment of Andrei Kostin as the country's prosecutor general. Some 299 deputies in the 450-seat parliament have endorsed his appointment. And of course, this comes following uh, his earlier nomination to replace the prosecutor general that was removed by President Zelensky last month amid the claims that her office had failed to root out Russian collaborators. Just a couple of other pieces of news as well. Ukraine is now in talks over securing the world's biggest active loan from the International Monetary Fund worth up to £16.6 billion to help shore up its war-torn economy. That's according to the country's central bank governor. And in lighter news, uh, Boris Johnson has presented Vladimir Zelensky with a Churchill Award for Moral Courage. The British Prime Minister said that the test of leadership faced by President Zelensky compared to that of 1940, and he saluted his superb indifference to physical danger. At the ceremony in number 10, the Ukrainian president attended virtually and was handed the award by Boris Johnson on behalf of the International Churchill Society. As I say, Boris Johnson praised Mr Zelensky for staying in Kiev just as Mr Churchill had stayed in London during the Blitz in 1940. And quite a nice quote from President Zelensky in response. He said, This is my extreme honour to receive this award for leadership. Ukraine was not left alone after February 24th. We had those who were helping us who remembered in the darkest times what is honour. You, and this is to addressing Boris Johnson, you have not thought of quitting the struggle. I'm talking about you, Boris. This award is yours as well, as this is the manifestation of our joint leadership of Ukrainians, Britons and all those who will not give their freedom away to any tyrants. So that's where we are at this moment in time, Sophie. After this, Francis and I caught up with David and Dom live in Ukraine. I started by asking David about his morning in the town of Butcher. His stories are pretty emotive and contain descriptions some may find upsetting. Yes, I am in Butcher. I've been here all morning. I'm in the kitchen of the Savchenko family. Igor Savchenko has been showing myself and Ilya, our translator, around Butcher. So we've gone to lots of different sites. We've heard a lot of stories from the local people about the occupation and what they went through. It's been quite a moving and terrifying experience to go around the, the town and, and, and get it firsthand from, from local people, pointing to various positions and pointing to various places and talking us through what happened. I mean, when we came to Butcher, the first thing Mr. Sashenko Igor did was outside his apartment. He just talked us through some of the, uh, some, some of the things that really I don't, think, I don't think you would see unless somebody pointed them out. So we looked in his building and there's, like most buildings in Butcher, there's a bit of damage on the first floor. One of the uh, one of the windows has been bl- blown out, and there's this sort of d- dark um, scorch marks. But on the ground, Igor was pointing to th- little things like you bend down and pick up little fragments of of Russian of Russian uh, shells. Trap. I've just got one in my hand now. It's an incredibly tiny thing, but if it was travelling at you know a thousand miles an hour, it ripped ripped through you. So he was showing us a bit of that, and also little things like the curbside where where the tanks would drive on and the tank is so heavy would crush the curb and obviously scrub off all the paints and get deep into the concrete and you wouldn't necessarily know that's what that was unless it's pointed out and also the white marks that a tank track would leave as it turns or parks up because there were tanks around the building i'm in now we went on a little walk basically just around the block and it's it's quite Something to see. I mean, now it's obviously high summer in, in Ukraine, so the foliage is out, there's lots of leaves and the trees are, are, are full. But the damage and everything else is still present. I mean, every, most, of, most of the fences, you can see the shrapnel, which is torn through it. You can see um, the shell splatters in the floor, which is where a, a shell lands. And from the direction of the, the blast, will send, will send the shrapnel in different directions. And so you can sort of tell. So I'm just standing up in the kitchen. And Igor, when we were here earlier, he told us that from this window, he could see the Russian tanks kind of below, m- maneuvering in in Butcher, and then the fire, the fire of, of the, the rockets going to and fro between the Ukrainian army and the Russian army. I mean, this is the background. I'm sort of looking out, and you can't see much now because it's 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 summer, and the, the trees and the leaves sort of obscure everything. But of course, this stage of the invasion, the trees were bare, so you really could see far. He, he said he didn't want to spend too much time by the window at that point. And actually, if I turn round and look down the corridor he said that when he was back in the flat he would usually sleep next to the door which is sort of in a little alcove sort of out two 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 walls behind where if there was a blast you know so he should have been protected 
from there, from the little walk around the block, we went sort of more into the town centre. We were going to go to the school, essentially. So Katya Savchenko, who listeners may remember, we talked to quite a few weeks ago to talk about her experiences in the shelter. That That's why we've come to Butcher, to try and under- talk to people and understand what they went through. So we, we went towards the school and we were told that actually... Uh, it's Ukrainian exam season, so there's lots of students doing their exams. We'd have to come back in about you know, 20, 30 minutes, um, let them finish, and then we could, we could go down and have a look. Opposite the school, there's a big square with, with um, incredibly beautiful fountains. You know, B- Butcher is, is a remarkable place. It's very, very, you know, there are parks, there are, there are, the apartment buildings are very attractive. And yeah, we're in this square, and uh, Igor pointed out that in the corner of this square, back in February, there was a sort of Santa's Grotto, you know, a little wooden house. And he said that in the early part of the invasion, when there was no fuel uh, and there was no electricity, they would go out of the shelter and they essentially stripped the Santa's grotto bare, took the wood back and used it for fuel. So you can go there and see it. I have a photo somewhere and it's just the sort of skeleton of a little hut. And actually later on in the school, they showed us the place where the the remains of the Santa's grotto are now. Then we went into the school and I I must be honest, when I spoke to Katya before, I had in my mind sort of a big room I hadn't really comprehended just how just how uh, extensive this complex was. I mean, Ilya, our translator, I mean, how many rooms? There were sort of 10, 10 rooms? No, precisely. Yeah. precisely. yeah, I mean, long, long corridors, small rooms, big rooms, some of which were painted and you know, dance studios and that sort of thing, and others which were completely unfurnished. Um, and they said that up to 500 people were, 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 were down there at the during 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 march sheltering from from the russians and we met an extraordinary we were sh- sort of shown around this complex under the school by an extraordinary committee of of people and um, uh, vitali who's handy money works 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 with um works in the school who became a bit of a, a bit of an organizer and a leader under in the, in their time underground Igor himself obviously who who t- sort of did a bit of everything and was doing his best to help uh, natalia vitali's wife who's um sort of the deputy director of the school and several, and several of their kids as well. Stas, Natalia's son, who was very keen to show us uh, little bits of um, uh, Russian missile, that, the, the sort of flag, the explosive flag that he picked up and you know, came over and, sh- and showed us that. Um, so it was incredibly. I mean, they, they were talking about uh, in the early, you know, in, in March and February, how the temperature there was seven degrees below zero and barely better in the actual shelter. So they'd have to go out to find. Uh, clothes to make sure people, you know, wouldn't 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 free wouldn't freeze to death. Um, and bumping into Russian patrols, and I mean, this was it was it was a re- interesting experience because, on the one hand, these 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 remarkable people went through um, an experience that most of us couldn't possibly imagine, but they they they, they, were, they they talked with positivity in some senses of the of their of their unity of their newfound friendships of how they work together like, to 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 help people to save people. And there were obvious tragedies. I mean, Vitaly talks about um, a man he knew, who I think Katya mentioned as well, called Vlad, who's 30 years old, he was in the shelter, and uh, said how Vlad saved his life because he and Vlad had gone out to find water. And Vlad had had some military training uh, in the days, in, in, in 2014, and said to Vitaly, will you stay back, I'll go first. Uh, and the Russians picked up Vlad, and they didn't see Vitaly. Vitaly got back, and they didn't know what happened to Vlad, but they found him... They found him later in the mass grave, shot in the head with his hands tied behind his back. So there's, there's stories of absolute tragedy alongside the, the strength and resilience of the people who, who kept their community safe. And after leaving this shelter, we go back up through the school to the gym. Uh, and it, I, I must admit, there were sort of elements of 90s British uh, schools there as well. I recognise some of the monkey bars, I think. That's something, something we had. Uh, but this, the gym has been transformed into a, essentially a, a sort of depot area, an aid area. And you go in and there are boxes and boxes and boxes of, of, of rags and cloth uh, and all sorts. And there is a group of uh, women and children you know, of, of all ages. We spoke to a, a woman, um, Nina Ivanova, who was 80, 83, 84. 82. Uh, and there was a kid who was sort of five, six years old running around helping as well. And um, in one corner, they're making mattresses for the Ukrainian army. In another corner, they were sort of ripping apart bits of plastic and making them into camouflage suits, which, which they very proudly showed us. And they look good. They really, you know, you, they showed us a video of the, the camouflage suit being used. And I didn't realise what it was. I thought they were showing, showing me a missile strike or something because I just couldn't see the guy. Um, so it was absolutely extraordinary to, to see that. Uh, and, I mean, you know, they, they sort of constructed wooden looms and were weaving these, these scraps of cloth together. And then you look at the finished products and it's... Uh, 
it's it's a camouflage suit which is sent straight to the army or it's something for the snipers or it's something as a cover for, for a tank or something like that um and then after that, we sort of left the school, said our goodbyes, and took a little drive, see the edges of Butcher and the edges of Erpin. Uh, we spoke to, um, well, we, we, we sort of talked to Igor again, uh, and I, I asked him, you know, can, looking around at everything, we're standing in this sort of slight wasteland between, between different uh, apartment blocks, and you can still see the damage. And we've just come down the, the very famous road, if you remember, listeners, um, this very famous road in, in sort of in between Butcher and Erpin where a Russian tank column were annihilated by the Ukrainian artillery we'd just come down there and I asked Igor you know, could he ever forgive the people who'd done this uh, and it was well I say I did do listen to the podcast I think for that answer because he really thought about the question and the answer I thought was extremely interesting um, the idea being that you know maybe eventually maybe historically but these people the, the invaders who came here that you know if I look at, out the window if I was here three months ago you'd be able to see the tanks the idea that you could forgive people who ripped apart your family and your, your life and your town and everything you, you'd strive to build is, 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 very, is very, very difficult. And actually what you feel, even though it's not a good feeling, what you, fe- what you really feel is uh, anger and, and a want for revenge. And just, just one more note from me, I think, which is interesting. So I'm here with Ilya, who's been wonderful, been translating, been helping out all, all, all morning. We've been, oh, he's blushing. <laughs> he's, done, he's done a wonderful job. Um, Igor tells me, you know, he, he came from the east. People, people came from Donetsk and Lugansk uh, to, to get away from the Russian military in 2014 and the time before that. They left the east to come to the west to build a new life. And Bucha, as I said, Bucha and Irpin are attractive modern suburbs. Um, and they came here and war followed them. They couldn't get away. And they just happened to be at the front line where of this part of Ukraine, which which was almost the, the, the lapping of the wave. And it was this is basically as far as Russian forces got um, before they were pushed back. And the atrocities and the, the murders and the cruelties uh, that they left behind were, were, were revealed after after the retreat. Um, so that's been our morning. We, we just got back to um, the Savchenkos. And they very kindly, as I said, they fed us. Um, absolutely delicious. <laughs> so thank you very much, Mrs. Savchenko. I can't see her. I think she's gone into, into, the, into the living room. Uh, we're just in the kitchen, Yulia um, and I. And uh, Katya, if you're listening, we have seen your cat. She's looking extremely well. Uh, and I, I've got a photo of her. So that's, that's, that's been my, my, my morning. I hope that's it's useful. I mean, it's, it's been an incredibly interesting thing to see with your own eyes what's, what's happening. And to have people who went through it sort of talk you through. Uh, what they went through in those early months of the war. Um, one thing I'd quickly say, just before we go to Ilya, is something I didn't really mention, is when you do drive around uh, Bin and Butcher, now, obviously we're months after um, uh, the last Russians were forced to retreat, um, there's, there's a lot of reconstruction. You can see a lot of people um, putting new windows in. The windows that aren't completely replaced are sort of patched up. Um, we, you, you can see cranes around as, as buildings are sort of patched up on the sides. Um, so the, the number of completely destroyed buildings, there, there are still quite a few, but there's, you know, there, there, are children out dri- um, there are children out riding their bicycles in parks. There are people, you know, having coffee, sitting outside, going to cafes. Um, in many ways, I mean, for British listeners, this is, this is essentially sort of an, it feels like an affluent London suburb that you might get out of a big city and have a nice apartment in Bootshire. It's really, it's, it, it's, it's prime real estate. It's, it's, a, it's a lovely, lovely little town. Wonderful parks, you know, cafes everywhere, and then to, and, and you can almost going around now. You can get seduced into that, into 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 that sort of vision, and then you turn a corner and there's a, a mall which is which is completely destroyed, which has been gutted and it's machinery with bowling alleys like spilled out. Or you turn another corner and there's an apartment which windows have been blown out and nobody lives there anymore. Or you turn a corner and there's, there's still, you know, a a, a car um, burnt out, it's just sitting there because nobody ever came back to it. And as I said, you know, with Igor, you look at the ground and suddenly you see, oh, tanks were there, there and there. Ah, oh, they fired a, a, you know, you can tell from positions of things and where people are pointing things out, you know, there, were, there was artillery, there was a tank fire from here to that building and we don't know if they got out. Um, so the, 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 the history of the extreme violence and cruelty is, is still all around you. Um, and that the summer, you know, the summer and the reconstruction has not covered it. But I'm here with Ilya, who's been doing the translation, been coming out. I think Ilya is a very interesting person to, to talk to about this because, Ilya, you're um, not originally from Kiev. You've come from the east, from Lugansk. Um, and when we were going around together, I thought your reaction to the things we were seeing was very interesting because I sort of said that you know, this is, gosh, what, you know, look at what they're doing. That's incredible. And you said it is incredible, but 
this is normal. David, you've got to understand that this is just what normal, this is most Ukrainian schools or places will have something like this. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience and uh, of, of seeing how Ukrainian society has reacted to the invasion? Uh, yeah, like uh, today Ukrainian society is like live in this reality. So we are not... Uh, it's not incredible, like destroyed houses, schools, uh, it's like awful, but uh, we see it uh, like uh, every day since 24th of February and uh, uh, personally me, I see this from 2014 when uh, Russia invaded us uh, the first time and like, yeah, you just get uh, used to it and this is like, uh, this is your reality, you live in a book of uh, Remark or something like that. Cheers, guys. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll sign out now. So thank you very much. And thank you again uh, to the Sashenkos for their hospitality uh, and for showing us, showing us their town. So we'll speak tomorrow. Goodbye. Thank you, David, for that extremely detailed and moving dispatch. I would say Katia, who David mentioned there, for people who haven't heard the recent episodes of our podcast, there is an interview with Katia Shevchenko that... Um, David did um, about a week ago, I'd say. So do go and find that because it is an amazing listen and it certainly brings to life what David is experiencing firsthand now. Um, Dom Nichols, now you're, you're not with David today. You're not travelling as a pair. Can you tell us a bit more about what you've been up to this morning? Yeah, hi, Sophie. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm joining you from the, the centre of Kiev, the central government district of Kiev. Um, a bit of a bit of welcome rain arriving here at the moment. Not not heavy metal rain, although um, there are, the air raid sirens were going off earlier on. Uh, and we're going to talk going to talk a little bit uh, later about the, the situation here and describe what it's like to be in the um, a couple of hundred meters from the from the president's palace um, uh, or sorry presidential office. Apologies and the uh, and the parliament here in the central government district, surrounded by armored vehicles sandbags and an awful lot of guns um, to, to you know, try and give a, a feel for what it's like to be in a in a major uh, a European capital under uh, the state of war. But just firstly, briefly, I mean, this morning I was out, I was out at a training area in the city of Borisville, which is 15 k to the east of here. And I was speaking to one of the, the, the battalions, the, the local uh, volunteer battalion, so not regular military at all. These, these were uh, everyday, everyday folk who came together any time from 2014, really, um, who came together to to defend their local area. They buy their own equipment and clothing. Um, they are given weapons ammunition by the government, but that's it. They have to find their own accommodation. And their their headquarters were in, or their headquarters are, are in, a, in a sort of local, it, was a fire, it used to be a fire station. It was gifted to them, and they but they sort of... Um, have to make do really and just build build from the ground up but it was it was very impressive i was speaking to the deputy commander of the um uh, of the f- fourth company of the first boris bill battalion so the, the battalion is about about 1500 strong for the for the city and, the, and each company is about about 150 or thereabouts and we were on the ranges and uh, to see these uh mostly men but they're women as well uh being put through basic training different levels of basic training basic weapon handling and that kind of thing on on the ranges. I think there's going to be more of that in the in the afters uh, for the uh, for the podcast. So I won't go into any more detail of that now, except to say that from what I could see, it was it was a it was a professional training environment. It was very self help in terms of building the range, but in terms of safety, um, it was it was good. There was one guy who was who was firing from a number of different positions, kneeling, sitting, and standing. And uh, and he was firing one minute, and then I, I looked around, and he was doing doing press ups. And I asked, "Well, you know, what has he had? He missed the target. You know, what was going on there?" And the instructor uh, said to me, "No, no, no. After he finished firing, he he took his finger. Oh, well, he left his finger inside the trigger guard, so resting on the trigger. And that you you do not do that as professional soldiers. You don't have your finger on the trigger unless you mean to to employ your weapon. So this chap was was having to do press ups as a punishment for for poor weapon handling drills, i.e." When you finish firing, you take your finger off the trigger and you don't put it back in the trigger guard um, because it's very easy to release a round and, and injure yourself or, or kill someone else. Um, that, that that's not happened to me. Uh, it's happened I, in Afghanistan. Somebody was killed um, on my tour through that through through what's called a negligent discharge. So it's very very serious, and hence any weapon handling um, faults are are dealt with 
fairly harshly. So this guy was under basic training. All he had to do was a few press ups, but he's not going to forget that. So as I say, I thought it was quite a quite a professional outfit, quite a professional training outfit. Um, and there are more on that, uh, more from more from the the group there. A group of people aged between eighteen and seventy, and Vadim, the, the deputy commander, who showed me around, um, who's who actually is a diplomat. He was works for the foreign ministry before the before the war. He was nudging the right flank of that age group, but um, yeah, a broad age group and men and women as well. But um, that's uh, more to come in dispatches. After that, I went and spoke to uh, a group called the the Rating Group, and these are opinion pollsters and they provide information to well a, num- a number of clients including the government here including the, the foreign affairs ministry and some quite interesting um, stats as you'd expect the, the the feeling amongst the population towards uh, russia has, has gone down markedly since the start of the war that you know not not surprising a couple of stats i thought were were interesting the language at home so not not one's native language but the language that is spoken at home um, the stats there, because a lot of people speak Russian for business or for other other sort of formal um, uh, areas of, of life. So the language that's spoken at home is quite an interesting stat. And in in July, uh, or from 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 July 2012 to April this year, it's gone up for those that speak Ukrainian, 41 to 51 percent, um, but it's collapsed for Russian, 37 down down to 15. Um, and and the, the bit in the middle, those that speak both have have gone up as well. But so so people who are choosing to, uh, I mean, it's all about identity, obviously. Those those that are choosing to identify more with Ukraine, uh, I thought was quite interesting there. Um, also, how long members of the public think this war is going to last? Uh, from uh, over a year, six months to a year, or um, or just a, just a few months. And between March, actually, the start of the war, and now, the, the the number of people who are saying either six months to a year or over a year has gone up significantly. So there seems to be a general, there seems to be an acceptance by uh, the population or an understanding, a belief that this war is going to be long, that it's not going to be just a, just a few weeks. Um, it, quite markedly higher in the in the category of of, uh, of over a year. Uh, and one of the most most startling statistics I thought was the um, it, it shows the increasing rate of unemployment among those who had a job prior to the war, and that is going up. So those people who who were made un, uh, who were out of work because of the war um, and are still out of work that that is that is or have lost their jobs since that is going up, particularly in the centre of the country, not just Kiev, but the central region of the country, and that is that is going to. Um, be significant, I think, if if there are increasing numbers of unemployed as this war goes on, that is going to have an effect for society and and the the economy in in the long run. But um, so one to watch. It was one of those sort of things that was hidden there, but I think that is is quite significant. And just finally, the people's attitude towards how to end end the war. They were it, uh, very broadly: should it be through negotiation or should it be a military solution? So keep fighting until until you know until you've won, basically. And those stats they were they were wobbling around uh, since the war started. They were wobbling around fairly static. Um, those that thought it should be negotiation and those that wanted an out and out military uh, victory after Butcher, after the the events we've we've seen there and and the stories that David has been reporting on today, after those were, were made public, and we've now got all the, the investigations going on there, it, it has swung dramatically. I mean, not just not just a slight increase, it has swung dramatically. Negotiations are now virtually off the table. People are not interested. Right now, they're, they're very strongly backing a military victory or, or continue the military conquest. Um, I, there seems to be this feeling that Ukraine society realised that that there's no negotiation. They they are. Um, it was suggested to me that they're coming to the uh, belief that Russia wants to er- erase them as a as a country, as a sovereign state, and therefore there's no point in negotiating. And negotiation with Russia, as we've seen, there's there's generally a, a missile fired into wherever the next day, or some some you know attack. And, and so there seems to be a much a greater hardening of society. So a hardening for the war, um, a hardening that it's going to be a long war, but also worryingly, as I say, that that increasing rate of, of unemployment um, because of the war. And I think all those things together is going to be um, stats to watch over the next the next months of this war, because I think it it is quite telling. I've got something else on on the what is what life is like here in the central government district. Um, Max works with the Transatlantic Dialogue Centre. It's a think tank here based in the 
central government district in the middle of Kiev. It's a, a think tank uh, not attached to, but w- works very closely with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I just thought it'd be really interesting to to give people a, a feel for what it's like being here in the centre of a capital at war, a couple hundred metres from the president's office, a couple hundred metres from parliament, a couple hundred metres from the, the from the office of the cabinet ministers, um, you know, right in the heart of government here, sandbags on every corner, armoured vehicles, guns everywhere. Uh, just, just just to feel what it's, what it's like to, to live and work here on a daily basis. Not forgetting, of course, in the early hours of the war, this was where... Um, Russian parachutists arrived and other people, not quite sure where they came from, but other people that, that attacked this area. There were gunfights in the streets here. As it's assessed, Russia were, were trying to find, um, uh, capture and or kill President Zelensky to, you know, to, to, to cut the head off the top of the government right in the early hours of the war. So this is this is where some of the most intense fighting in those very first few hours was was happening. Um, so I just thought it would be interesting to hear from Max, who's right here with me now. Yeah, Hi, everyone. So we are now in the government district, and it's completely close to any visitors. This uh, district is known for lots of protests, marches, different political rallies, when million, millions of people have been protesting against certain political decisions of our parliament, president, or ministers. Now it's allowed only for several hundred of people to enter this district, and there are several steps for you to follow. You must prove that your organization has its office here. This office has been owned or rented by your organization before the full-scale invasion. And like 95% of people walk in the streets, they are working for or with the government. Your personality is then uh, thoroughly checked by the security services to make sure that you are not a Russian agent and then you are granted a permission to enter the district. Each time you enter it, you must show your ID, permission to enter and give access to all your bags. And if you are entering by car, which is also possible for those having a separate permission, then you get ready for a car check too. And the government district is considered to be one of the top targets of Russians because all branches of Ukrainian authorities are situated here, located, and you're always under threat of the shelling or even tactical nuclear attacks because Russians did threaten with the bombing of decision-making centers in Kiev uh, recently and on the very beginning of this war. And you also know that there was heavy fighting in the government district like uh, like I said before, uh, during the first days of the full-scale uh, invasion. And several groups of Russian saboteurs were really eliminated and the government expects more to come. So we are now constantly waiting for them. However, we have a good security system and we do believe in our army and Dominic can uh, tell you even how uh, he countered the problem today and by trying to enter this government uh, district um, back in the afternoon. Yeah, not not a situation that that happens quite a few times in my life. To be honest, someone took a took a dim view of, of me and my face, and uh, I was held for quite some time at the uh, at the the front gate next to uh, next to all the the sandbags and what have you. And it took a little while before my um, well natural charm, quite frankly, took over and uh, and we were allowed in. But Max, so just talk talk to us today. So it's quite empty here because you know a lot of the offices are are closed. There's not so many people who would normally be working here. So w- what? What, do you feel safer coming to this area that you know has been attacked and is under a great, great threat and there are a lot of guns around here? Do, do you feel safer coming inside the wire or, or does it make you less, less confident? No, for sure it's ma- it makes me less confident in that. And when I enter the government district, uh, my uh, relatives or my uh, friends, they uh, also ask me, uh, to inform them about my status. If uh, if we have any air raid sirens here in Kyiv, then I receive many calls and messages like, please get out of the district and so on, because everybody knows that it's under constant threat of shelling and so on. So basically we try to hide, uh, we try to avoid uh, looking in the windows, uh, try to use the rule of the two walls when there should be two walls between you and the street. The one will take the explosion blast and the second one will take the, uh, actually the uh, those parts of the missiles and rockets falling down. Shrapnel. Uh, yeah, shrapnel. So uh, we are now uh, we are waiting for the Russians to come and to hit this uh, area with missiles uh, 24 hours a day. So it's very interesting moving around here. A lot of the, a lot of the doors are are closed, locked, and and blockaded. A lot of the windows, likewise, are at ground floor and and uh, and some of the other levels as well. Um, and in order to move around, you have to sort of squeeze through um, through some small spaces. I was told when I got here 
yesterday that there was going to be a fitness test for me. And I thought, I said, well, what are we going to, we're going up a, you know, a dozen flights of stairs. Surely it's not, it's not too wise to get to the top of a building if, if there's a threat of missile attack. And this was met with sort of laughter by my hosts. And they said, no, 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 it's not that kind of fitness test. And it turns out that we had to squeeze through the, the sort of lift shaft, um, right now to squeeze past the actual lifts that are out, that are out of, out of service now, but, um, through the little gaps between, between the lifts and, um, you know, if you're if you're built for comfort, not speed, you're, you're going to find it a struggle. But I'd like to say I passed the test with fine colours. So, Max, th- th- has the threat gone up? We've had air raid sirens in the city this morning. Uh, d- has the threat gone up today? Yeah, for sure. Uh, the level of threat is increasing heavily today. And we've had uh, lots of uh, things that Russia will attack uh, Kyiv today or in the following days because Ukraine is going to counterattack in Kherson. And that's why we expect the Russians to uh, revenge, uh, revenge us uh, using the ballistic missiles. And But I think that we are ready. We have received some new air defense systems from Norway and other countries. And we uh, expect the West uh, to send us uh, more because we need to protect more cities, not just Kyiv, not just the government area. Uh, we need to protect our people in Mykolaiv, in Kharkiv, who are uh, shelled day-to-day basis. So the, the air defense system... Um that you're referring to, though, I think is the NASAMS, the Nor- Norwegian American Surface Air Missile System, a very, very uh, highly capable um, anti aircraft missile system. You've also received today, it was announced, six Stormer vehicles from Britain. Stormer vehicles, uh, well, Stormer is the vehicle and it hosts the um, the uh, Star Streak missile. So, so Britain has already supplied Star Streak Surface Air missiles in the ground role. They're not, they're not shoulder launched, they sit on a tripod at about shoulder height so you the, the operator stands behind it to fire but doesn't carry the, the device that carry the system on his or her shoulder but star streak missiles have already been delivered and and we think used to effect you'll know better than me looking for a nod i've had a nod uh but the storm of vehicles arrived today six vehicles with with um i don't know the number of star streak missiles uh with those stormers but uh, yeah more surface to air missiles arriving today um as we've seen from russia when when something happens, so the grain deal, for example, they then they they then just sort of follow it up with a little a little gift. Um, hence, uh, Odessa was hit last week. So, with the with the situation in Kazan that's ongoing, and it looks like there is a, a, a um, if not a counteroffensive, then certainly localized counterattacks happening down there, and those bridges are being denied. I.e., they, they cannot be used by heavy military vehicles, but they they are still passable just by. Um, civilian vehicles so that's why um, it's assessed that the threat has gone up here in the city because we're we're expecting um, a response from russia and as i said the the area sirens have been going off this morning that it's all quiet now but um uh we will see i'm off this afternoon to go see some other folk who are much closer to that particular um action than than we are here right in the center so hopefully i'll bring a report on that tomorrow and um yeah speak speaking to some other people who are who, who have been very up close and personal with the with the fighting so far but i think i'll leave it there um max thanks very much indeed thank you for your hospitality and um i'll leave it uh, back to you guys in london you might have heard the mayor of kiev vitaly klitschko pop up briefly on our podcast yesterday Here's the full interview he recorded with Dom and David in his office in Kyiv. Well, Mr. Klitschko, thank you very much indeed for making time again for the Telegraph. We met last time at the NATO summit in Madrid, and now here we are in your office in in Kyiv. Um, So thank you for having us here. May I ask, what is the mood of your city at the moment? It's a difficult question. Uh, From beginning, you see the blue sky, sunshine, summer, and uh, you can't uh, realize in just a couple hundred kilometers uh, south or east from here is a huge battle where died every day our citizens. The mood in the city is actually the people right now coming back, already three million citizens uh, coming back in our hometown before the war was uh, 3.6 million. We have right now around 200,000 refugees from all parts of Ukraine who come to Kyiv because in Kyiv is uh, much more safety than uh, somewhere else. Uh, Better services uh, regarding medicine, education, 
but uh, regarding in mood better than a couple of months ago people spend a lot of time in the bunkers on the ground in the ground bunkers uh, because they worry a lot and we calculate right now so a lot of children still in the west of Ukraine or outside of Ukraine and uh, in the first day of September everybody go to the school but now we have uh, not so much children in our town and that's why we open not every school and every preschool in the first of September. Uh, we doesn't listen explosions anymore as a couple of months ago but people still nervous. And you say there are not as many explosions as a couple of months ago. So maybe the the adrenaline, which you'll know much about from your former former life, the, if the adrenaline is wearing off, is there a fear amongst the people? Is, is fear coming to the surface? But perhaps irrational fear, but the fear of the unknown? The people uh, actually worry very much regarding the whole situation because um, it's any second, any minute, the Russian rockets can... Uh, uh, destroyed any building in our hometown. This uh, happens two weeks ago, and uh, people died. A lot of people was injured, and uh, yes, of course, as everyone, every citizens of our hometown, beginning the day from the news, what was was going on in uh, east of Ukraine, uh, was going on in south, and uh, everyone believe uh, right now with the news from the front line. And are people still observing all the security requirements? If there's if the air alarms go off, are people going to the bunkers, or is there a sort of a different mood? Are people sort of a bit more relaxed, not in a good way, but relaxed about that, and not not observing these these drills? One side, the people uh, care very much, but from another side, uh, people doesn't have panic anymore, and they accept current situation as normal, as if, if we can say that normal. We actually right, right now adapted to live in this war condition. And what signs do you look for to see normality, proper normality returning? How close are you to that? So long time, so long time. Right now is good weather and peaceful atmosphere, it's illusion illusion because if you starting to talk to everyone from beginning to the end the people talking about the war people talking about how long it will be the war how long they will be uh, wake up in the, in, during the night how long they are running on the grounds how long they we became the bad news and horrible news about the diet of our citizens how far russians want to go and uh, the people talk about these points non-stop in the last months. What is your reaction to that? How do you give confidence to the city? Uh, it's, very, it's very important to give the information to people. It's very important to talk to them. It's very important to give objective uh, news uh, to everyone. It's very important to follow the rules. Right now, the safety is a main question for every citizens of our hometown, not just for our, for every citizens of Ukraine. Uh, whole country was shocked last week. The Russian rockets destroyed the middle of the uh, city, exactly the center of Vinitsa, and more than 20 people died. A lot of people was injured. Children was killed. And uh, the Russians always have explanation the target was military forces, but they killed civilians. Russians have always some excuses uh, in the, in this war, and do you, do you, I mean, in terms of they always have excuses. It's it's not your city clearly, but but um, the strikes on Odessa last week, just after the grain deal was signed, and the excuses that. Russia made after, after that. Do you, do you think there is ever now room for accepting anything Russia says formally or any treaties they sign? Please, never believe Russians. From beginning, they lie. 
they were they uh, told and promising our territorial integrity and, and independence in 1994 as uh, Ukraine give up our nuclear weapons. Russian promising and give the guarantee our independence and territorial integrity. This was live. The Russians told the uh, people with green uniform is not the uh, representative of military forces of Russians. This was live. This was Russian forces in Crimea in 2014. Right now, the Russians told it's a special operation against Ukrainian military forces, but they never accept the pictures if they killed civilians. Thanks God, we have a lot of um, uh, international press in the uh, capital of Ukraine. They immediately delivered the pictures, images, uh, horrible images for the whole world, from Butcher, Peng, Gastamil, Baradyanka, but we don't have so many in, uh, uh, international journalists in uh, Mariupol, uh, in uh, Sumy, uh, Chernigiv, in other city, were killed thousands and thousands of civilians. Russians always lie. And that's why to believe Russians right now is the biggest mistake. If you never believe a word they say, then that... They, by the way, I'm sorry, they, by the way, talk right now the war against nationalists, uh, mm -hmm. radicals, uh, fascists in, uh, in Ukrainian government. What they talk about, we don't know. They make a war against Ukraine. They don't need Ukrainian. They want Ukraine. They need just property without the uh, population. And that's why uh, after the images, horrible images, uh, I can talk about them definitely, is genocide. It's not a war. It's genocide of Ukrainian population. If you're not happy with Russians, you will be killed. Most wars, historically, end by negotiation. Very few end by complete military conquest of one side over the other. So what you've just described there leaves no room for a negotiation, leaves no room for talking if you have no trust in the other side. Are you suggesting that this war cannot end through negotiation and there is only a military solution? Right now the Russians talk, let's uh, find a compromise, let's find a solution. We will be ready to, to talk about that. Just after that, the last Russian soldier left Ukrainian territory. It would be a good point to talk about solution and compromise. If Russians occupied big part of Ukrainian territory and right now tell to us, let's find a compromise, it's a not compromise to find solution if Russian soldier right now uh, destroyed our territorial integrity and right now in our homeland. I guess I understand it's a very difficult point, but uh, we have to fight and to defend our homeland. We doesn't have another choice about the compromise. I don't know what we talk, what we can talk uh, with Russians. Your city, if it has not been already, is about to be the global focus of war crimes investigations, international investigations for prosecutions. What steps have you taken to ensure that those investigations are done in, in a way that is believable to the majority of people in the world who can see it? We're ready for investigation, but we need this investigation. Thousands and thousands of our citizens killed. Which reason? Which reason the Russians occupied the uh, uh, make invasion to to Ukraine? Which reason? Ukraine was always peaceful country. We live peaceful people. We never was aggressive to anyone. It's more than seventy nations live in Ukraine. The reason of this war is everyone in the world have to understand clearly. The reason of this war senseless war. Our wish to be the part of European family, to build a modern European country. 
in quite a country. Kremlin never ever accepted that because they have a plans, Putin have a plans to rebuild the Soviet Empire. And Ukraine is very important puzzle in these plans. We don't want to live in an author, in, in authoritarian regime. We don't want to live with dictator. We don't want to live in the country where there's no human rights, no press freedom, no democratic values. We don't want back to USSR. And it's a clear message to Moscow, clear message to Putin. And we fighting for our future. We fighting for our children. And also, very important message. I'm more than sure we win this war. As former fighter, I tell you, size is not important in the battle. The power is not so important. It's very important. The will and spirit. Our soldier already surprised the whole world. Ukrainian army, I mean. World experts told a gift to us a couple of days, a couple of weeks against the one of the strongest armies in the world, Russian army, which have much more soldier rockets, uh, planes. Are you ready to give your life, lives up for the money? I'm more than sure for the money and lives, nobody will be ready to give up. The Russian soldiers paid well. They're fighting for the money. No ideology behind this war, in this invasion. The our soldiers defend our children and families. And the question, the second question, are you ready to defend and give up your life for your family and children? I'm more than sure everyone told yes. There's a difference in this war, Ukrainian and Russians, where we are in our homeland and we are defending our future, defending our families. It's not easy war. The Russians have much more rackets, bigger army. They are pretty strong, but they can't destroy the spirit of the people. You never have better soldier which lose his family and children. This soldier will be angry to defend the memory of his children. If Russians destroyed our city, our homes, our country, the Ukrainian soldier very, very motivated to win this war. I know what I talk about. I talk to them. Talk to many soldiers. They are very tough to fight. And everyone told, we never stay in the knee. Better we died. Mr. Klitschko, thank you very much for talking to The Telegraph. My colleague David here just has a couple of questions to ask if you may. You talked earlier about the impact of the international press showing the pictures of Erdogan and Butcher and how that changed the world's mind and persuaded countries to help Ukraine. Five months on, I think from our perspective, you can see Ukraine is less in the headlines. People are reading less. What would you say to billions of people around the world who are starting to look away, who maybe are losing interest in what's happening in Ukraine? What would you say to them? Clear message. It will be biggest mistake for everyone to think the war is far away from us in some way in Ukraine. It doesn't touch me personally. It's biggest mistake. Please don't forget, Ukraine is one of the largest countries in Europe. Disability, economic disability, political disability in the war, and one, one of the largest countries in Europe can bring disability in the whole region. Also, this war can touch everyone in the world. Please don't forget, Ukraine have five nuclear plants. The wreckage flying uh, above their nuclear plants. 
if one of them destroyed reactor, this would be much bigger catastrophe than, than, than Chernobyl. In this case, this war can touch everyone in our planet. Right now, we actually fighting and defending not just our families and not just our children. We fighting, I hope, for the same values what we have. The same values we defending every European, every one of you. I know the mentality of Russians, I know the mentality of Putin. They accept just power. They never accept the weak people, weak country, weak position. We think they, Russians, will be happy with annexion of Crimea. And after that, the next mistake, we think they will be happy to occupy Donetsk and Lugansk. They not. Kyiv was target and still target of Russians. But how far go Russian? As far we are allowed to go. They go to the Poland board. We re- listen right now the messages from uh, Kremlin uh, about Poland, Baltic countries. Putin want to rebuild Soviet Empire and please don't forget the big part of Europe was part of Soviet Empire just a couple of years ago. And they go so far. And biggest mistake to underestimate that. This was biggest mistake. We Ukrainian never believe the Russians in modern time can make invasion uh, to, to Ukraine. We everybody don't believe on that. This was mistake. And that's why uh, please to uh, listen my words. It's not the war between Russia and Ukraine. It's a war between democracy and dictator. And that's why it's very important to support Ukraine because we are fighting for every one of you, everyone uh, in, uh, in Europe. It's not big wars, it's reality. It's a uh, hard reality and in this hard reality we pay biggest price what we have, human lives. Every Ukrainian I speak to talks about how much they um, love Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister who's now leaving. Could you give our listeners uh, a sense of why they, they love Boris Johnson so much? What, what was it about his support for Ukraine that touched um, the Ukrainian people? Uh, simple explanation. If another European country tried to play diplomatic way, let's investigate, let's see, we have to think about our decision. The Boris Johnson showed the real leader skills. They taught Russia is aggressor, Ukraine right now occupied from Russia, the Russians destroyed all international rules, we are support Ukraine. Not just with our words, we support Ukraine with the weapons. And Great Britain um, and Boris Johnson uh, told clear messages, first point, and second, they moved forwards to support Ukraine without uh, looking in other countries. They sing too long. We discuss about Nord Stream 2 so long time and finally stop this project in Germany. We're talking so long time about the weapons, to sending weapons to Ukraine, defending, uh, I want to spell defending weapons, because we defend our country. That's why in politics it's very important le- leader figure. Leader figure in this point, the Boris Johnson show the leader skills as politician who don't lose the time and make hard but very powerful decisions.
everyone in our planet. Please, be proactive. Do it everything to stop the war, to make a pressure to Russian Federation to stop this senseless war, genocide of Ukrainian population. Thank you for everyone who still proactive, who do everything to save our world and save lives of people of Ukrainians. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk forward slash audio or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so that you don't miss it. David and Dom aim to join us every day, live from Ukraine. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. We're especially interested to hear where you're listening from around the world. And if you're in Ukraine, keep an eye out for our two intrepid reporters. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, and today on Twitter, Sophie Tano.